Well, thanks very much for doing this. It's a pleasure to meet you. Bob. Have you done the others yet? Uh, we did uh, Augusta and Bernard on uh, Tuesday afternoon. It was delightful seeing them. I'd met Bernard before at SIU. He'd been down there to do some, uh, some uh, uh, concerts with some friends of mine. Uh, we did uh, John Canning yesterday, doing yours today, and we're doing uh, Father Donald on the way out of town tomorrow. And we'll come up and do uh, uh, Glenn Tilton sometime in October. Coach K we did in, uh, in Chicago while he was here. And uh, Hillary we weren't able to get to. I don't know if we're going to be able to talk to her in person or not. But, uh, She's coming here soon. She's going to speak at the Economic Club. I forgot the date. I think it's this month. Okay. I'll keep an I'll keep an eye out for that because they're generally speaking when you agree to accept the award you agree to do the interview but she swept in and swept out of town uh, when they actually gave the award we'll try again we'll try it but check she's going to be here this month I will yeah <coughs> thanks for the heads up um, well first of all we're going to start at the beginning tell uh, a little bit about your early life uh, you were born in Milwaukee. I was born in Milwaukee uh, in 1926. I had a very happy uh, childhood with a superb uh, education. Uh, I went to Washington High School in Milwaukee, which is one of the best uh, high schools in the country. What kind of values did you learn from your parents when you were growing up? Neither of my parents uh, were born in the United States. Uh, they were brought here by their parents when my mother and father were both small children. And they were uh, hardworking, um, loved this country with a passion, and uh, uh, sent their kids to college and universities. And uh, I grew up uh, in, during the Depression. And then I enlisted in the Army in World War II at age 17 and uh, served in the U.S. Army in the China Burma India Theater. Were you in the Signal Corps? Did I ever the Signal that? Corps. I had a friend from Carbondale who was in the si Signal Corps in the same place. Well, my unit uh, was the 835th Signal Service Battalion. Our mission was to build the first telephone line connecting India and China. And we, I was fortunate, I was sent to the headquarters in New Delhi rather than the jungle in Burma where the hard work was done, but we did succeed. Well, my friend uh, uh, Bob, he was uh, uh, an intelligence officer who, uh, was, uh, who would receive coded information from the field where they needed supplies dropped and things like that in uh, places like Thailand and Burma and everything. It's really interesting. Um, what led you in into the field of law after, after the war? I, <clears throat> I've often wondered myself about that. My children, who are all three of my daughters are lawyers, uh, my wife and my children asked me that. I think it was largely because during the war, uh, I had three birthdays in the Army, my 18th, 19th, and 20th birthdays. I was a kid. But I became very interested in the process of democracy, uh, politics, how we govern ourselves. And I think because of that, it led me to want to be a lawyer. And uh, was it Northwestern you did? I went to, yes. When I, when I, before I went in the service, when I was still in high school, I applied to Harvard and I was admitted to Harvard as an undergraduate. When I came home from the war, I called Harvard and I said, is my Admission still good. They said, yes, we'd love to have you, but we cannot provide you with any housing. We've put up some tents in the Harvard Yard, and we put veterans up there. And I said, I've just been through that the last uh, few years. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> interested. And my dad said to me, uh, why don't you go to Northwestern? And that's what happened, fortunately for me. What year was that? What year were you in law school here? I graduated from the law school in 1950. Okay, so that would have been about the time when uh, 
Oh, let's see. The former uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Mary Ann uh, McMorrow. I didn't know her, but Dan Walker, who later became the oh. governor of Illinois, he was uh, uh, one semester ahead of me. Okay, and well, Don Clark Nitsch was there too. She was in. She was, uh, and I knew her in college as well as law school. Okay, I, I I loved her. I loved covering her as a politician. She was so much fun. At that time, Northwestern Law School encouraged its graduates to go into some form of public service, and many of us uh, did that. Well, indeed, uh, you of course uh, clerked for. Uh, Justice uh, Vinson, if I remember correctly, uh, and uh, you became an advisor to Adley Stevenson. Well, I was fortunate. Northwestern recommended me. I became law clerk to the Chief Justice of the United States, Fred Vinson, and um, from there, uh, one of our law school professors, who was counsel to Governor Stevenson, uh, uh, asked my my current law partner, was we've been together more than 60 years, Howard Trinas, asked Howard to become his assistant. Howard wasn't interested, but I told him I was, so I got hired. And I moved, came to Springfield exactly the week he was nominated for president, 1952. Wow. Well, there's connections between, we were talking about Paul Simon earlier, there were connections between Paul. That's when I met Paul uh -huh. in 1952. Okay. Uh, were you active in Democratic Party politics before? No, I was not. I was not really a, a Democrat. I was a, an independent, or occasionally voted Republican. I became a Democrat because of Adlai Stevenson. And uh, I believe you worked on both of his presidential campaigns. Yes, and and then he later asked me to join him uh, in private practice, and we started a law firm, and I practiced law with him until all of us in the Chicago office of the law firm went into the government in the Kennedy administration. Well, that's the next question I'd like to ask about. Uh, of course, Kennedy uh, was hugely popular here. Uh, how did you get uh, how did you get to come to work in his in his in his campaign? During the 56 presidential campaign, the Kennedys asked Stevenson to appoint Bob Kennedy to the campaign staff. The Kennedys wanted Bob to have some experience in a national presidential campaign. Uh, Adley had uh, considered Jack Kennedy as his vice presidential running mate in 56. Uh, and um, Bob was on the 56 campaign staff. Because Bob and I were the same age, uh, we often were paired up as roommates, and we became good friends. And through that, we became friends with the uh, Kennedy's uh, sister, Eunice, who lived here in Chicago, and her husband, Sergeant Shriver. But that was our introduction to the Kennedys. Of course, she went on to campaign for Kennedy in, in 60. Right, and uh, actually, uh, Bob and I had a very interesting experience in Springfield in 1956. Adley uh, came to campaign in Springfield, and uh, Bob said to me, he said, uh, he said, Newt, you and I have heard this same speech 538 times. How far are we from Abraham Lincoln's house? Have we got time to go there and play hooky on this speech and come back in time to catch the plane? I said, yes, it's only a couple of blocks. So I took him over to Abraham Lincoln's house. That time it wasn't open to visitors, but we walked all around the outside. And on the way back, Bob said, we had a conversation that in many ways changed my life. Because Bob said, we started talking, and Bob, we had children the same age. And Bob said, you know, he said, when I was a child, there were three influences on a child's life. Home, school, the church. He said, now that I've got kids of my own, I see there's a fourth. It's television. The kids are wanting to watch television all the time. So we started talking about television, and because of that, we kept in touch, and Bob knew how deeply interested I was in trying to improve television, especially for children. I think that led to my being appointed chairman of the FCC in 1960, 61. 
Well, I'd, I'd read that you didn't have really any background in communications law up to that point. But I had some. I was a lawyer for Bert Telstrom of Kuklafran and Ali, and so I had done a lot of contracts uh, for Burr. My college roommate, uh, Sandy Van Oker, was the NBC political correspondent. So I, and I was a lawyer for a Ford Foundation project in educational television. So I had some, but I was deeply interested particularly in how I thought public service was required for, by more broadcasters. Yeah, it, it had always been in the FCC Act but what the, the action you took really kind of raised the, uh, the bar for it and got a lot of more people thinking about it. What I'm proudest of were two things. We launched the first communication satellite, which tied the world together in new ways, and we got public television off the ground. Uh, I had gone to the FCC from Chicago, was familiar with it. President Kennedy had gone to the White House from Boston, he was familiar. We discovered there were no public television stations in Washington, or New York, or Los Angeles, or Philadelphia, or Baltimore, or most places. So we changed all that. Well, it certainly changed lives in rural America, too, because our station went on in 1961. And uh, that led to you know, an enormous change in the quality of life in our area. Well, I felt it was important. I thought the government's role should be to provide more choice for people. And we certainly succeeded in that. Today, there's enormous choice. You uh, uh, had an opportunity to address the National Association of Broadcasters about uh, uh, public interest and uh, the state of commercial television at the time. And uh, that famous phrase, the vast wasteland, came about. Can you tell me how that worked its way into the speech? I had a very good close friend named John Bartlow Martin, who was a great writer, a journalist, and a speech writer. He wrote speeches for Adlai Stevenson, for the Kennedys. He volunteered to do a draft of a speech for me, and I used parts of it. He wrote, he used the phrase, vast wasteland of junk. I crossed off the of junk and used the term vast wasteland. I paid no real attention to it. I didn't think it was important. But the press seemed to catch on to that phrase and that became part of the language. How was the, how was the speech received by the NAB? Very poorly. The, um, uh, in fact, there was a funny thing that happened after the speech. The then president of the National Association of Broadcasters was the former governor of Florida, Leroy Collins. And I was standing with him and a man came up uh, to us and was shaking hands and he said, Mr. Minow, I didn't like your speech at all. And uh, about 10 minutes later he came back again a second time. He said, I've been reflecting on it. He said, that was really a terrible speech. And then he came back a third time. He said, you know, Mr. Minow, I've been thinking about it some more. It was probably the worst speech I ever heard in my life. And Governor Collins was with me, he heard all this, he put his arm around me. He said, no, don't let that man bother you. He just repeats everything he hears. Oh my gosh, well, it turns out that uh, I worked for a gentleman whose son was NAB president for a long time, Eddie Fritz. Back oh, I know Eddie. Yeah, yeah, well, I worked for his dad in Paducah, Kentucky in radio back really? in the 70s, yeah. I just saw Eddie uh, earlier this year at uh, passing of an Illinois broadcaster. Well, he was actually one of the members of the Academy, uh, Russ Withers. I don't know if you knew Russ or not. But. I didn't know him. <clears throat> I became uh, friendly, believe it or not, with many of the broadcasters. Frank Stanton and Bill Paley asked me years later to go on the board of CBS, which I did. So I've seen, and then I was on the board of the Tribune Company. So I've seen television from every angle, from the public television, commercial television, I've seen it all. I want to ask you more about the, the, the creation of what we now know as public broadcasting, but I want to go back a little bit uh, and, and ask you to reflect on that, that phrase. And you uh, were in the, quoted in the Atlantic about 50, on the 50th anniversary of that speech. 
How has uh, how's the medium uh, stood the test of time since then, or how's it how's it fallen short of what your aspirations were? Well, my aspiration number one was to expand choice, and we did that. We now th through cable, through satellites, through what is a form of pay television, we have enormous choice. If you're a old movie junkie as I am, I can watch old movies all the time. If I'm a, if you're a sports junkie, you can catch sports all the time. If you're a news junkie, so there is now much more choice. What has gone wrong, in my opinion, particularly on the commercial side, is there are too many commercials. There should be a limit, which I tried to do when I was in the government without success. There should be a limit on the amount of commercial time. Uh, the broadcasters themselves have a limit that they don't enforce of six minutes an hour, but they don't enforce it. Uh, second, I wanted to get public television going, to use this great medium for education, for culture, for information, and that's been very successful. I became, I was very fortunate, I became chairman of PBS, I've been chairman of our station here in Chicago, and I'm very proud that we perform a great service for the public. Um, of course, I kind of grew up around WSIU, the public station in Southern Illinois, got my education there and have worked there for many years. And I've seen how that station has really changed lives in, in, in that part of the country. You, you were there really at the, at the foundation with the, the public telecommunications acts. Uh, you were on the board of governors for PBS, and later its chair, and the Carnegie Foundation. Tell me about those those early years. It must have been a really yeasty time. We saw the News Hour, the McNair, McNeil Lair News Hour come along, Sesame Street. Just last night, one of my daughters found. She did a lot of research and found an early educational television program in which Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, in 1962, interviewed me and others about the future of educational television. I, I watched it at home last night, and I was thrilled to see that many of the things we dreamed about have happened. What are you most proud of that's been uh, accomplished by PBS and NPR and all the other non-commercial stations? I'm proud that we have, um, I'm particularly proud of things like Sesame Street, uh, where Joan Cooney, I was, I've been on, on the board of the Carnegie Foundation, which funded uh, Joan's work. And I think that has changed lives for millions, millions of young children. It's an example of what can be done. I'm also very proud of the communication satellite impact. Uh, President Kennedy took me on a tour once of the space program. And he called me aside, he said, what's this all about with this communication satellites? And I said, Mr. President, communication satellites are more important than sending a man into space. He said, why do you say that? I said, communication satellites will launch ideas into space. Ideas last longer than men. And it's true. Today the world has become much smaller in large part because we can see and hear what's going on all over the world at the same time. Well, it's interesting, you know, we were talking about Paul Simon just a few moments ago and about the documentary. We're just, I just received a call while we were here that they, we've developed a curriculum around Paul's career for uh, high school students and middle school students using clips out of the documentary. And that's one of the things a local PBS station can do that a lot of other stations would never even attempt it to, to you know, teach about the value of public service and, uh, and the like. You know, this fall, uh, PBS is launching the new Ken Burns series on the Roosevelt's. I have seen it because I was lucky to get the DVDs before it went on the air. I would hope every American and every child will get to see that series because you can get a glimpse 
an understanding of American history over a period with Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, that you couldn't get any other way. That's a treasure for, for, the, for the future. Oh, I'm, th I'm looking forward to seeing it. I had the pleasure of talking with Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, earlier this year when she was at Carbondale, and she was telling me about her relationship with writing the book and everything. She's on the series. She She's on the series. And interesting, we knew Mrs. Roosevelt, and when you hear her voice on the Ken Burns series, it isn't her voice. It's an actress. It was uh, uh, one, of, one of the great actresses of our time. God, why don't I remember her name at the moment? But, but she does Mrs. Roosevelt so well, she's perfect. Hmm. I can't wait to see it, yeah. It's uh, seven, it's seven parts, it's gonna... Seven parts, two hours each. That's a 14 hour commitment you gotta make. I'll be happy to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, programs like that, uh, NOVA, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, well, the, the news hour, the PBS news hours, uh, every, I watch it every night if I can. You, you get all sides of every issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've also worked on uh, all the presidential uh, uh, debates since, what, 1976? Uh, well, actually starting in 1960 because um, the debate started because of an article that Adlai Stevenson wrote in 1960 calling for presidential debates and Congress, as a result, changed the law so that you could have debates, change the equal time law. So I've been involved, I've been blessed to be involved in every single presidential debate. And at my age, I'm 88, I'm still on the Presidential Debate Commission, and we're just planning the 2016 debates. Wow. I'm getting ready to do a gubernatorial debate in Peoria. In Good for years. you. And, uh, it's, it's, we've benefited from the work that you've done, there's no question about it. Um, let's see. I'm curious, you know, we've talked, we've talked about broadcast, satellite communication. Did you ever have any sense of what the internet was going to become? No, and of course I think the internet today is the most important change in communications since the invention of radio and television. It's a mammoth, monumental change, particularly young children uh, who are more adept at using it than people my age. But it's just the beginning, I believe. It. I believe what's going to happen is that the computer, the internet, and the television set will all get married into one and will do and see things. I think the future of communications is so exciting and <clears throat> will benefit all of us. What are, your, what are your thoughts on net neutrality? I think there's a big argument about what that means. That's the first problem. I majored in semantics in college and I think people are using that term to all mean different things. They don't, aren't not able to agree on what it means. What's the most, you, you've been active in so many different things over the years, but uh, uh, and we could um, go into n any number of them, but for you personally, for what you've been able to do in, in public life, what's been the most personally satisfying thing that you've been able to have an impact on over the years? Well, I was very proud to be part of the Kennedy uh, administration. Uh, it was a different generation taking over the leadership of the country. It was a very exciting period. It was so different from today when today there's such bitter, bitter partisanship. Uh, <clears throat> I was able to get three major bills through Congress on a bipartisan basis. When I was at the FCC, which is a bipartisan agency by law, I never would allow a partisan vote, and we never had one. The Today, I just hate to see what's happened to American politics. Yeah. yeah, it's not particularly edifying at the end of the day. Um, you've raised a, a fine family. Your, th your three daughters have all been successful in the law. Could you speak to that? 
I was very lucky to meet my wife in college. We've been married more than 65 years. We have three daughters. They astonished us by all becoming lawyers. Uh, one is a, our oldest daughter is a combination of a uh, corporate governance activist and a film critic, a national film critic. Our second daughter is a legal scholar. She's the dean of Harvard Law School. Our third daughter is a librarian and a lawyer and is, was appointed by President Obama to the government agency that gives money to libraries and museums. <coughs> She's an authority, a recognized authority on copyright law and the digital age, which is a very complex set of issues. So all three of our daughters, our only problem is that our three daughters all have one fault or two faults. One is their zip code and the other is their area code. None of them live in Chicago. And uh, one is in Boston, one is in Washington, <coughs> one is in Cupertino, California. Uh, in Apple country, literally. <laughs> we have one granddaughter who's involved in television. She is on the costume staff of Mad Men. Really? And she's now working on a pilot uh, for that Amazon is experimenting with. We have one grandson who is a teacher in New York, a public school teacher. And uh, we have one granddaughter who is just starting a graduate program in creative writing. So we're very proud of our kids and our grandchildren. Justifiably so. You're still uh, coming into the office, still, still working? Still come in three days a week. I'm in a great law firm. We are all over the world. We've made a particular huge commitment 30 years ago to Asia, and we're in Tokyo, we're in Beijing, we're in Shanghai, we're in Hong Kong, we're in Singapore, we're in Sydney, and uh, we're in Europe. We're, we're, we're very proud of, I'm very proud of what we've achieved here. We will celebrate, the firm will celebrate its 150th anniversary in two years. What are, the, what are the issues that still excite you the most that you still want to get involved with? What excites me the most is the uh, lack of public service time for political candidates. I resent terribly that so much money is being raised by candidates to buy broadcast time. As far as I could see, what's done in Canada, what's done in England, what's done in Europe, what's done in Japan is much preferable. You shouldn't be able to buy time. You should be have access to reaching the country without money. And this idea that the Supreme Court has come up with, that money is speech, that speech is money, in my opinion, is terrible. It has a corrosive effect. Terrible. Yeah. I think I'm at the end of my questions, but there's one more I always ask. What uh, what was your thought of uh, your reaction to having learned that uh, you were being named a Lincoln Laureate? I was particularly thrilled because I'm an adopted son of Illinois, and uh, I love Illinois. When I was accepting the award, I quoted my boss, Adlai Stevenson, who treasured Illinois. My wife has been a member of the board of the Abraham Lincoln Museum in Springfield. Uh, Lincoln and Illinois are two words uh, that are treasures uh, to me, and I'm very deeply honored to have this award. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Jack. Uh,